Hey everyone, welcome to Churchtown University Online. I'm Samantha. Today we're going to be talking about two fundamental pieces of audio, and that's gonna be polarity and phase. Now I'm gonna be drawing along while I'm talking to really help illustrate what's happening. This can be very abstract, but this is vital information that we all need to fully understand. So let's just dive right in. To start off, we're going to be talking about polarity. And before we start talking about polarity, we need to start talking about just like what sound is and how we visualize it. So sound is just vibrations, just really small changes in air pressure. And that's all. I'm gonna draw a little, a little guy here, get some little hair on him. And you can see if this person is singing, but there are moments of higher air pressure and there are moments of lower air pressure. And we can, I'm gonna put in some dots here and you can kind of see where these kind of condense more and they kind of spread apart more and then they condense more again and they spread apart again. And we actually do this just like right on a graph. Moments of high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. And as soon as that goes into a microphone, what spits out is a voltage representing exactly that. That's actually also called a, a transducer when we take acoustic energy and we move it into the electrical domain. So, and that's what microphones are. Polarity is, is binary. It's in or out, it's up going, it's down going. It's which way a signal may be trending. It's either positive or negative. Again, in, out, there is no really gray zone for it. Now I make this next comment a little bit lightly, but you know, natural sounds, like if I were to clap my hands or when we're speaking, it all starts with a, with a positive way where we're creating the pressure change forward. It's forward moving. So it's just a, something good to remember. So perhaps you've heard somebody say something was, was in polarity. So when we're saying in polarity, what we're actually saying is that if we begin with a positive moving polarity, we will end with a positive moving polarity. If we are out of polarity, we may start with a positive moving polarity and somewhere along the chain, it gets flipped around and then it starts negatively. You know, inversing the polarity is literally just taking all, everything that's the, you know, all of the high pressure or the voltage that's going up and making them negative and all the negatives into positive. Just remember if something is in polarity, that means if it comes in positive, it leaves positive. If it comes in negative, it comes out negative. Being in polarity means it's staying true throughout the chain. I'll do a little drawing here, just to kind of show what we're talking about. So we'll do a little wave here. Then we've got a little arrow and we've got it going into a microphone and it comes out and looks exactly the same. We start positive and then we go negative. All right, so that means that it's in polarity. But okay, so what if we go down and we're starting positive when we go negative, we go back through the microphone but then it's inverted, so now we start negative and go positive. Well, that means it's out of polarity. Again, not a bad thing, we just like need to make sure we understand that that's happening. Sometimes it can cause problems and sometimes it doesn't cause a problem at all, it, it all depends. But what we need to remember is however the signal may be acting when it comes in, we want it to do that same thing on the way out unless we are purposely inverting it. Let's draw another picture here. So. Let's say we've got a little person here and they're singing and I'm gonna have two microphones and we'll pretend that they are exactly the same microphone. There is no difference to them at all. The only difference that we're going to put in is that we're going to invert the polarity of one of the channels. And for those of you that don't know, it's that little, um, it looks like a zero with a slash through it. So if we push that, it'll actually invert the polarity of one of the signals. So if I've got two microphones and they're on one singer and they are like touching, they are so close. And we run it through the system and we combine it at the soundboard, the soundboard. When we sum these two channels and they come together, I'll make one green and one red. What is red and green together? It's like a bluish orange, we'll, we'll just do orange. They actually end up canceling out. And so that's what's important to know is if we invert the polarity, you know, it's like adding a positive one and a negative one together. When you add a negative and a positive together and they're the same number, it, it goes up to zero, you know, goose egg. So that's what we need to keep in mind is polarity. It's like, it's in or out, yes or no, up going, down going, it either is or it is not, black and white, that's it. And again, being out of polarity is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not often that we have two microphones on the exact same source and you know, one of them has a polarity reversal. It doesn't happen very often, but some other things do kind of happen. Maybe you've heard of if you have, you know, two mics on a snare, 
maybe you flip the polarity of one and maybe it sounds better. And maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. And that's something that you have to just try. But again, if polarity is just in and out, you know, it's either in polarity or it's out of polarity, you know, what happens if we want to do something in between? And that's where we start talking about phase. Phase at its simplest is just a point in a wave cycle. It is frequency specific, but we'll get into that in here just a second. So, all right, let me draw a uh, wave here for us. And okay, so what is a cycle? A cycle is is formally one period. You know, uh, it's an it's an oscillation. It's just if you know what it looks like on a drawing, it it makes total sense. So we've got here we go we got this wave and this is one cycle one period 360 degrees cycles per second is actually our frequency so the more cycles we're able to have in a single second means we're going to have a higher pitch the less cycles we have per second we're going to have a lower pitch we know right here at the end this is 360 degrees one cycle one complete cycle all right we have that memorized now so halfway through then would make that 180 degrees. And we'll kind of reference that as a half cycle. The reason I like to say cycles instead of degrees is because if we recognize that frequency is cycles per second, then it makes a lot more sense for us to be able to divide it. It's very logical for us to transfer from one unit to the next. So rather than going from degrees to frequency, we're just going to land and cycles per second and, and cycle world. So half a cycle is 180 degrees, but then we also have uh, the less popular uh, 270 degrees, which is three fourths of a cycle. And then we have 90 degrees, which is a quarter of a cycle. The biggest points we need to remember are these four right here, just splitting the wave into fourths. So one cycle, three fourths cycle, a half a cycle, and then a quarter cycle. If we had two copies of this exact signal, like I do right here, you know, I can move this around and actually change the relationship between these two signals. I can actually say, oh, uh, if they were right on top of each other perfectly, we could say that this was either zero degrees in phase, this is perfectly in phase, or we can say it's 360 degrees in phase. For, for our intents and purposes, 360 degrees and, and zero degrees are the same thing. But then if I can, I can move it over and say, oh, well, you know, these two signals are 90 degrees off. Or if I move it over here, these two signals are 180 degrees off. Or I can move it even further and say, oh, well, you know, these two signals are 270 degrees apart. And then we're back at 360. When two copies of the same frequency are 180 degrees apart or 180 degrees out of phase are half a cycle, if they're half a cycle off, uh, they'll actually at worst cancel out entirely. Just like adding that negative one and a positive one equaling zero, same sort of deal. There are some very specific differences between, you know, phase and polarity, like we had said earlier, you know, polarity is in or out and phase is, is all of this gray area. So we have, you know, that's exactly how I would how I would illustrate it is polarity is black and white and phase is gray. So we can move phase around. There are many relationships within phase. But just like I had said earlier, you know, polarity, black or white, in or out, it either is or it is not. The next word that we really need to become familiar with is wavelength. So the wavelength is understandably the length of the wave, but it is more formally the distance it takes for one wave to complete one cycle. To do that 360 degrees, however long it takes to finish that, that's the length of the wave. And it's different at every single frequency. If we're able to have more cycles per second, right? Earlier we had said if we have more cycles per second, that means it's a higher pitch. Well, if we're squeezing more cycles in per second, the cycles have to be smaller in order to fit into them. So, okay, so 20 hertz is the bottom of our hearing range. And 20 hertz is actually like over 50 feet long. And 20,000 hertz, which is the absolute best we're able to hear. I, I can't hear at 20,000. And um, I, I've taken pretty good care of my ears. But even at 20,000, that wavelength is only like 0.6 inches. And that's a huge difference. So that means it would take 50 feet for one cycle of 20 hertz to actually be complete. And it would only take a little over half of an inch for 20 hertz to be complete. That is such a huge difference. 
So let's kind of talk about these relationships here. So wavelength and frequency are actually inversions. And that sentence is a little sciencey, so let me break it down just a little bit for you. Wavelength, the length of a cycle, uh, either like how long it takes to complete like time or how long it is, like distance. And frequency, how many times per second a cycle is completed, are inversions. So as one gets smaller, the other gets bigger. As one gets bigger, the other gets smaller. And I'm gonna highlight this relationship. So we have one kilohertz, and that takes one millisecond to complete one cycle. And it actually is one foot long. So this is a really easy, just one, one, one across the board. If we can remember these relationships, it will make doing all the inversions super easy in comparison, instead of memorizing a bunch of, of lengths and times and things like that. So two kilohertz is, well, two is twice as big as one. So let's let's remember that. Okay, so it's twice as big. So if they're inversions, that means it's going to take half as long to complete. And, and I guess that kind of makes sense. If we're having twice as many cycles in the same amount of time, we have to make them smaller in order to fit. So that means if we double the frequency, so we're going from one kilohertz to two kilohertz, that means that it will take half as long. So we're gonna have the time. It goes from one millisecond to half a millisecond. And same goes for, for feet. So again, we're cramming more into one second, so it's gotta be half as long. It's also half of a foot. What if we halved the one kilohertz? So let's say we've got 500. 500 hertz is one half, and we're gonna remember that is one half as much as one kilohertz which means half as many cycles per second are happening. So we should take twice as long to finish. So let's say, okay, 500 hertz is one half of one kilohertz. So it's gonna take twice as long, which means it goes from one millisecond to two milliseconds, and it goes from one foot to two foot. But let's do something crazy. Okay, so uh, 100 hertz is one tenth of a, of a thousand hertz. Let's say 100 hertz is one over 10. It's one tenth as big. That means it's gonna take 10 times as long to finish or 10 times as much space to complete a cycle. So that means it will be 10 milliseconds long and it will take 10 feet. So that is what inverse relationships look like. As we make one smaller, the other ones have to get bigger. If we make uh, one bigger, the other ones have to get smaller. And so really, if we're able to remember that and this just one, one, one relationship, understanding wavelengths and um, cycle times is actually quite easy. And it's a really fun party trick to do later on. Okay, so I'm gonna do some more drawings for you guys. I'm gonna draw another graph here. And just to further my point that we were just talking about, about inverse relationships, I'm gonna make this graph and I'm gonna make it one millisecond long. We're gonna say, this x-axis, it's one millisecond. So everything we, we do has to fit within one millisecond. I know from uh, just the speed of sound that it takes one millisecond for sound to move a foot. That's why I picked one millisecond. It's a very easy number. <laughs> um, so, okay, all right, I'm gonna put the frequency right here and I'll do this all color coordinated so it's super easy to remember. Uh, we'll do the time, how long it takes to complete a cycle. And then we're gonna do the feet, like how long, physically long the wave is. Okay, so. Let's do one kilohertz first, because it's our favorite number. Uh, we know from that little golden ratio that it is one millisecond and it is one foot long. So let's do that, beautiful. So now let's do two kilohertz, okay? And it's twice as big, so it's gonna be one half the time, which means I'm gonna, I'll keep the fractions here so we can keep track of stuff. So it'll be one half of a millisecond and it will be one half of a foot. All right, four kilohertz is four times the size of one kilohertz. So it will take one fourth as long, one fourth millisecond, and then it will be one fourth of a foot. Perfect. All right, and then we'll add one more in. All right, so 500 hertz. All right, that's half as big as one kilohertz. So it will take two times as long, so two milliseconds, and it will be twice the length, so two feet. Oh, and uh, let me draw this. See, it, I can only complete you know, half of a cycle. And I'm going to just kind of 
hash line draw the rest of these waveforms so you can see how they're kind of fitting within one another. So the red is, you know, it's perfect. It fits right inside one millisecond because that's its cycle length. It takes one millisecond for one kilohertz to complete one cycle. So we do that, but then you can see as I double it to two kilohertz, now I can fit two in there. And if I, four kilohertz, I can fit four of them in the same space. So, all right, so the question is, find 180 degrees. I mean, finding half of a cycle, it's different, and I'll even circle them here in gray. They're all at different times. So that's why it, when I originally defined phase, it's frequency specific. Like, I mean, half of a cycle at 4K is not the same as half of a cycle at 500 Hertz. Just like we've pointed out here, these, all these one cycle of all these different frequencies are vastly different sizes. And so whenever we're talking about phase, it needs to be in reference to a specific frequency. So you can't say things like, oh, that guitar is 180 degrees out of phase because that's at what frequency would that be true? You can't, you don't know, you can't tell, you know, some other people might say, uh, I hear this one a lot. Oh, uh, just hit the phase button on the input. Yeah, that's not a phase button. That's a polarity button, you know, where it polarity in or out, yes or no, you know, phase is that whole gray area. We can't, there's no one button uh, that we can hit that will affect frequencies, you know, equally. Okay, I can, sure I can scooch one frequency a half a cycle, but that's gonna have a much different effect on all the rest of the frequencies. So I hope that's making sense. I know that again, this can be super abstract, but you know, again, phase is just a point in a wave and polarity is in or out, yes or no. All right, so let's scooch up here a little bit and I'm gonna really draw you something special. Okay, so I'm a bass player, so why not draw a little bass player? <laughs> we'll give a little guy a little guitar and let's give him this big amp. All right, and we'll connect him right in. And let's say we've got um, an Allen, let's just say we've got an SQ6 soundboard. I, I know it's a beautiful interpretation of their board, but just stick with me here. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got a DI and we'll come straight out of the bass amp, just a direct injection right into the board. But then I'm also going to set up a microphone and I'll set that right next to the bass cabinet and I'm also gonna send that to the board. So. Both of these channels are going into the soundboard and I'm mixing them together to come out of the left, right speakers, which means they're getting summed together. They're coming together at some point and being sent out of the board. All right, so remember, DIs are happen almost instantaneously. You know, there is no, nothing needs to change, nothing needs to happen. It's keeping it as an electrical signal the entire way through almost instantaneously. But a mic, I mean, it does take a while because not only does the bass player need to play, but then the amps electronics need to make it back into a sound wave so we can hear it. And then it needs to, you know, flow through the air, propagate in the air, and then go back into a microphone and then go into the soundboard. And that takes time. I mean, not, not a lot of time, but it, it takes time. And let's say the mic is, I don't know, a foot away from the amp. So I'll write that down. The speed of sound dictates that it will take one millisecond for sound to travel one foot. So I'm gonna put approximately one millisecond here. And I'm gonna use, let me, I'm gonna make sure we keep this written down. And I'm gonna write it in yellow. So I'm gonna use a little Greek letter here. Uh, this little triangle, it's delta and it means the difference. Just, that's it. So we have a difference of one millisecond between the DI and the microphone. So what is this one millisecond difference going to do to my two bass signals? You know, like I said, we're gonna sum those together. They're going into the soundboard and I'm sending them out to, you know, the subs in the left, right speaker. So they're getting some. So what is one millisecond difference going to do? We know that the largest changes are gonna happen between two, you know, quote, identical signals at 180 degrees. Um, at worst, they'll, they'll cancel out. And at 360 degrees or at zero, you know, when they match up exactly, at best, we'll get an 
an added six decibels of level, which could be really cool uh, if we wanted to do that. So we know that those are the two biggest changes that, that may or may not happen. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on half of a cycle and a whole cycle. So what frequency finishes an entire cycle in one millisecond? What frequency finishes an entire cycle in the time it takes be to get between the speaker and the microphone? And I mean, hopefully you've watched the rest of this video and you're not skipping around, but it's one kilohertz. So one kilohertz fits perfectly inside of the space between the amp and the microphone. Perfect. So what frequency has half of a cycle long? Because that will be 180 degrees out, half of a cycle. So let's see, half of a cycle at one millisecond. That will actually be 500 hertz. Uh, and so by the time the sound gets from the bass amp into the microphone, there's only enough space to get half of a cycle at 500 hertz. So let's kind of relabel these questions here. The first one, what frequency has a cycle of a millisecond, aka which frequency is most likely to have an increase in level? Which one's gonna line up perfectly in that space difference? And the second question, which frequency has half of a cycle at one millisecond? AKA, which frequency is most likely to decrease in level? We know that if we're gonna have a problem, when I sum these two base channels together, I may have a six decibel increase at, at 1K, which again, maybe I want. Uh, and I may have a lot of cancellation at 500 hertz. If things are going to happen, those are the two frequencies they're most likely to happen on. And that's really good information to know. So I know that if I put the mic one foot away, I am most likely to have a problem at 500 and most maybe something I really like at 1K, or maybe it's really muddy at 500. You know, there are lots of ways to to attack this. You can either... You can purposely set up your mic so that it will likely reject certain frequencies or boost at certain frequencies, or maybe you just want to be aware. Let's say you don't want any boosts or any cancels at all, which I'm, most of us probably do. We just want two very closely related signals. Now that we know, hey, we put this mic one foot away, we should actually probably delay the DI channel by one millisecond, how long it'll take that signal to get there, and then they should be perfectly matched up again. And it's really as easy as that. And there you have it. That's phase and polarity. If you have any ideas of ways to use phase to your advantage, please send me an email. I would love to hear about them. And I would love to share the different ways that professional audio engineers use phase and polarity to help them do what they want to do and be more creative with things.